In The Seed Keeper, Diane Wilson writes this. Everywhere I looked, I saw how seeds were holding the world together. They planted forests, covered meadows with wildflowers, sprouted in cracks in the sidewalk. Seeds breathed and spoke in a language all their own. Each one was a miniature time capsule, capturing years of stories in its tender flesh. How ignorant I felt compared to the brilliance contained in a single seed. In this book, Diane Wilson tells a story of courage, longing, and renewal. What seeds of courage can we find here in this book? Many of us, white people wrestling with our complicity, and many of us, climate activists who work with or wish to work with indigenous people to restore the land. Our climate justice team has been an active engine in this congregation. Volunteers come together to not only meet once a month to talk about what we're going to get done, but we get things done. We plant trees. We planted trees with Tree Trust last spring and this fall. We've been working with the Unity Unitarian Canopy Connectors to learn about their really amazing program of growing trees on their property to then uh, give to neighborhoods that are lacking canopy cover. We got bike racks installed. We did a workshop with Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light meeting Unitarian Universalists from all over the city and in greater Minnesota. And we read books together. We don't just read books, but we do read books together. We've read some wonderful things and had great discussions. And Mary Ann Lundquist, I am looking at you with a big old salute, thanking you for really keeping this going. So when Mary Ann brought to us as a, a choice for our selection for this uh, book club, The Seed Keeper by Diane Wilson, I was so excited that we were going to read a novel and uh, a, a good story to really uh, sink our teeth into, and boy, have we ever. We're going to talk about it in assembly today, and we'll talk about it some more during our 1215 program. She says this, the author says this, I was inspired by a story I heard years ago while participating on the 150, the 150 walk to commemorate the forced removal of Dakota people from Minnesota in 1863. We know this as the reconciliation walk that begins in South Dakota and ends in Mankato to commemorate the largest mass murder in US history, uh, the 38 plus two Dakota warriors. According to the story that Diane Wilson heard, the women had little time to prepare for their removal. They were removed from the land in Minnesota and sent to the Crow Creek and Santee reservations. And they had no idea where they were being sent or where they would feed their families. And so they sowed the seeds saved from their gardens into the hems of their skirts and hid them in their pockets, ensuring that there would be seeds to plant in the spring. Even in the midst of crisis, they were thinking not only of their families, but also of future generations who would need those seeds. The novel tells this story through the voices of four Dakota women across several generations. These indigenous women were not the only ones who did this. We know historically that African women who were enslaved also platted seeds into their hair to bring to what, wherever it was they were being sent. They had no idea in their captivity, but they brought the seeds for future life. A powerful message. So here's a synopsis of the book. 
Rosalie Ironwing, Rosalie Ironwing, has grown up in the woods with her father, Ray, until one morning he doesn't return. Told she has no family, Rosalie is sent to live with a foster family near Mankato, where she meets the rebellious Gabby, makes peace, in a friendship that transcends the damaged legacies they've inherited. Years later, Rosalie returns to her childhood home and begins to confront the past on a search for family, identity, and a community where she can finally belong. In the process, she learns what it means to be descended from women with souls of iron. Women who have protected their families, their traditions, and a precious cache of seeds through generations of hardship and loss, through war and the insidious trauma of boarding schools. Weaving together the voices of four indelible women, the Seed Keeper is a beautifully told story of reawakening, of remembering their original relationship to the seeds and through them to their ancestors. Can I just see by a show of hands how many of you have read or listened to the book? Pretty good many, wonderful. So Diane Wilson, I, I was very curious about her to find out what was, she, she said she heard this story, but what was her own story? I wanted to know. And she has another piece that is published in the book, A Good Time for the Truth. We read this as a part of uh, an anti-racism uh, reading group a few years ago. And so, A Good Time for the Truth, Race in Minnesota, is published by the Minnesota Historical Press. And, and so she tells this story, and I'm really compelled by how she, now that I've read The Seed Keeper, how I hear this story echoed out of it. As I watched, I thought of my mother, who was enrolled at the Rosebud Reservation and grew up in a boarding school on the Pine Ridge Reservation. After her family fled the Depression in South Dakota to look for work in Minneapolis, she married a young man of Swedish descent and raised her children far removed from any native community. My siblings and I attended predominantly white schools where we learned a version of history that could not explain my mother's silence about her past, why she and her aunts attended boarding school, or why she received an annual check for allotment land in South Dakota that was so small that she and my aunts used to laugh about their inheritance. My father, on the other hand, recognized only that we were white, like him. As an adult, I spent many years learning who my mother's family was, a process that forced me to discover a different history from the one I was taught in school. Our family story led me to the hard truth about the genocide of Native American people in this country and the earlier generations of children who were forced to attend boarding school. My family's small role in this history had been shaped by the government policies that ultimately threatened either assimilation or extermination. Government policies that threatened either assimilation or extermination. Finally, I understood my mother's silence. I was left with the question of what, if anything, I could do to transform the legacy of pain and loss I had inherited. Our theme this month is on the path of courage. And I am so moved by Diane Wilson and other indigenous writers' courage and especially Miss Wilson, she heard and she crafted a story of generations of love and loss and a tie to the land. Her own path is one of courage to do the deep work of grief and then the work of return and renewal. And she based her story on food systems and seeds. Diane Wilson has previously been the executive director of Dream of Wild Harvest and the Native American Alliance for Food Sovereignty. I think I have that acronym right. So very much interested in her work outside of her writing work 
in how a return to the land and the stories that are held in the seeds are passed down generation to generation and how those seeds themselves are healing. Ella Deloria, who is a Yankton Sioux, wrote, the ultimate aim of Dakota life was quite simple. One must obey kinship rules. One must be a good relative. To be a good relative is to attend to the seeds, to the land, to the prairie, to the soil, to the sun, to the rain, to be to each other, to the animals and the plants and to each other. And that is the theme that runs through the book and the courage that's required to attend to those relationships. Toward the end of the book, an elder Carlos says, people don't understand how hard it is to be an Indian. I'm not talking about all the sad history. I'm talking about a way of life that demands your best every single day. To be a good relative to obey kinship rules is a demanding way to be. But can we imagine, can I imagine in my comfort and convenience in my world what it would take to be a good relative in every step, every day? To make each, being Dakota, he says, means every step you take is a prayer. Can I imagine what it is like to walk on this earth each step as a prayer to good relation, to good kinship? That is demanding. There was a tall grass prairie in southern and western Minnesota a sea of grass, a prairie formed over thousands of years, a vast landscape of deep topsoil and hundreds of species of plants and animals, the tall grass prairie. Between 1830 and 1900, as Minnesota had an insatiable desire for land, settlers and agribusiness, we became the wheat capital of the world. There was an insatiable desire for land and virtually all of the tall grass prairie was plowed under by European settlers eager to establish homesteads and farms on this virgin fertile soil. The largest, most diverse ecosystem in the central United States was virtually destroyed within 70 years. And in its place came a new form of agriculture, monoculture. You know about monoculture. It was the national leader. We were the national leader in wheat production. Ms. Wilson writes that the clash that began in 1492 was as much about our drastically different food systems as it was about our differing values, our languages and spirituality. Throughout the government's multifaceted assimilation policies, policies, controlling native food systems has been a consistent and deadly theme. So it's difficult often for me as a white woman to hear how bad, how bad, how bad settler colonialism was, how bad, how bad racist policies of the United States were. Oh, it's exhausting. And if it's exhausting for me, imagine how much more exhausting for people who live it, who live on the side of oppression of it. Those policies have been pretty good to me. And I think as I think of courage, we are all facing the loss of climate and habitat. Those policies that may have been good for us for a while aren't good for anybody anymore. Monoculture, agriculture is, is terrible for the land and the plants and the planets. I think we all know this. I don't have to go 
at length into that. Uh, in the book, she, she um, talks about Mangento. Is that the name of it? Mangento. Not a very, uh, she, didn't, she didn't conceal very much her disdain for Monsanto. I think I can say that. It wasn't, wasn't hard to figure out uh, who she was talking about in that. And, and her husband, John um, Meester, descendant of German immigrants who is white, has a family farm. And she marries him and begins to garden on his farm. And then Mangento comes to town and says, oh, these are hard farm years. We're going to help you. We've got magic seeds. And there's no downside to the magic seeds. You'll have guaranteed yield, but you can only buy our seeds. And you have to only buy our fertilizer and only buy our poison, our insecticide. And so she goes through what happens to the land and to the people who love the land. John Meester, her husband, he loves that land. It was the land that his family settled and it's, the farm's been there a long time. But he, she talks about how he has a hard time reconciling the either or of it. I think the thing that's important to me is that we know we're all affected by this loss of climate and habitat and species and lack of choice in the food we have. We go to the supermarket and it's an array of beautiful food. We are abundant in what we can buy, but fewer and fewer real choices. And if you want to eat organic, it's terribly expensive. We are caught in what agribusiness wants to sell us. And one of the elders says, Ernie Whiteman, an Arapaho elder, says, if you control the food, you control the people. If you control the food, you control the people. So what do we do with our climate grief? This is a very lively question for me. What do we do with our climate grief, our grief for our country, our grief for all the ways that grief shows up for us? And just now, it doesn't feel like there's a shoe waiting to drop. We ha the last two years have been so hard. And so just now, it feels a little more stable. But for me, that grief continues to wash up in waves. And it feels paralyzing sometimes. I want to say that for me, grief and beauty, joy and sorrow are woven fine. This exquisitely beautiful autumn that we have had here in Minneapolis. A few more days, maybe. That we can love this planet when she shows off. When she shows off our great Earth Mother that gives us everything we need, we can love her and also be in grief. And where I think courage comes in is that it's courage to keep moving forward in the face of apocalypse. Rosemary Rodmacher says, courage does not always roar. Sometimes it is the quiet voice at the end of the day saying, I will try again tomorrow. Courage to step out of our comfort zones, to do our interior work on what it means to have the face of the settler. When I was reading this book, it sort of rocked me back on my heels, the most obvious thing in the world. Oh my God, I'm the settler people. <laughs> the most obvious thing in the world, and it just psh, ding. The courage to do our interior work, to attend to our health, to repair a relationship, to leave a relationship, to run for office, to get sober, to tell the truth, to keep our own counsel, to let go, the courage to be vulnerable, 
the courage to confront our complicity in systems of injustice. <laughs> so I said that I, I sort of had that awakening moment. And according to Ancestry.com, my family on both sides is descended from Scots, Irish, and Northern European stock. I think of them as pioneers. They were probably not the first wave of folks who settled land. And if our history goes back that far to the pioneers, I haven't read it. My folks were rural farm folks working with cotton and cattle, some owners of the land and some tenant farmers. I always assumed in the game of cowboy and Indians, we were on the side of the cowboys, while the Indians represented something exotic or, and or pitiful, and the damage that popular fiction and Hollywood did to native people in this country is beyond shameful, actually to all oppressed people. It doesn't make me a bad person that I came from people who were settlers and that I am now a settler occupying indigenous land doesn't make me a bad person that that is so. It does require courage to step forward and engage where I can as a climate activist, as a racial justice activist, wherever any of us fall on the continuum of oppression and privilege, we all have a job to do. I am grateful for books and stories that do not center white people and my experience. I've read those stories and I learned the same history in class that, that Diane Wilson did. Most of us in this room learned that history. And we have to do, as adults, the work of unlearning it. And it takes courage to be present with that to not let ourselves get hooked by being offended and recognize that that's our colonialism that wants to get hooked. I invite you into that courageous work and recognize where seeds of courage come up for you, where you are connected to the land and the food that you eat. And if you are not, Gently, lovingly, ask yourself, why not?